Are you working in a nonprofit but having to work extra jobs just to make ends meet? Do you want to make a difference in the world but are completely burnt out from overwork and underpayment? Do you wish you could leverage your passions to change the world, but on your own terms, having the flexibility to travel and make the money you are looking to make? This is the Humanitarian Entrepreneur Podcast. We are building a network of global activists and empowering you to have the freedom to have a thriving business, making an impact in the world without burnout. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Humanitarian Entrepreneur Podcast. My guest today is Zola Rose. She is the founder of the social enterprise Common Ground in 2019 to enable and catalyze collective community-led housing development that increases the social, cultural, and ecological and economic well-being of communities based on the principles of regenerative development, permaculture, living systems, and eco-village design. Zola, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, it's such a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. That was a mouthful of terminology. So we're going to definitely dive into all that because as I was telling you offline, I have lots of questions. I've heard of a lot of these concepts, but I haven't got clear pictures. So I know that we're going to definitely dive into all that for all those that were like, I don't know what any of that was. So (laughs) can we start with you telling your story and what led you towards alternative housing solutions? Yeah. Well, as you were reading, a lot of it has to do with social justice. So housing is both the physical structure that is an investment, but it's also a human right, you know, for us to be housed and have shelter. And we've ended up with, at least in my country, but I do believe there's elements of it in every country. So I'm based in Aotearoa, New Zealand, Aotearoa being the Maori word for New Zealand. So we usually put the two of them together to be fully embracing of the Maori indigenous culture here. So we have had in this country particularly a real focus on housing as an investment and as a way to guarantee wealth as a retirement vehicle. And that has led to certain policies, our government protecting that housing as an investment vehicle, and it's created a grand rift between the haves and the have-nots, those who managed to get into the housing ladder about 30 years ago and take advantage of that. And those who are now currently trying to get onto owning a house or even affordable rent. And we have the most unaffordable housing in the OECD. So that's the, um, you know, the developed countries that New Zealand sort of aligns with economically. We have the most expensive. We are 10 times the affordability. So housing is usually supposed to be three times a household's annual income. So if a household's earning, let's say, $100,000 a year combined, really a purchase price should be about $300,000. So that's three times. But in this country, we're sitting at a million dollars for a house. So the ability to save, the ability to put a deposit down, to get finance is impossible for most people nowadays. It's fine if you've been in the housing ladder, working your way through all these decades. But in this country, we have about 50-50, 50% ownership versus 50% rental. And we have a very large increase in our population. We've got a lot of immigrants. We have refugee resettlement and things like that. So the amount of people growing, and of course, we've got young people like my children who are aged 17 and 19. They also fall into this category of those who will, if all progresses exactly as it is to have a house, will battle to afford even rental and a whole bunch of other factors. I've just written a report outlining 24 of the problems that we have surrounding housing in this country. So some of it's quality and having to do with structure, and some of it has to do with finance, land, the building construction industry, and availability of resources, and things like that. So we just have created this massive chasm that a lot of people are falling into. And so there isn't a recognition of alternative forms of housing. So we have social housing where the government or housing providers, we call them community housing providers, let's say like Habitat for Humanity, would then be serving a certain population who either are not earning at all or are earning fairly little. 
and those folks are served, but we have a waiting list of tens of thousands of people in this country that are on those waiting lists. So there's certainly not enough of those organizations to serve the amount of people that are in need. And then we have market housing, which is your million dollar house that is on the market. That's just, you find it on the real estate pages and things like that. And we actually don't really have anything else. So if you're earning an okay salary, then you're stuck. There's not many options for finance or for different kinds of tenure. And usually the tenure is you own the house and that's kind of it. You know, I, I buy the house, I own it, and, and that's all there is. And I own all the land around it and it's me and my house and it basically becomes like my castle. And so that mentality, particularly here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, is such that it's my domain, like I own this and I have a right to own all of this around me. And not that we have fences or walls, but there's just definitely a mental attitude of, you know, this is mine. And so the alternative housing model both is around the financing, so the tenure model, how we can get finance or funding to be able to own. And there's different models like a rent to buy model or a shared equity model of being able to finance differently. And then there's a topology. And the topology is what does it look like as a physical structure? And that might be like co-housing, where you have all the houses in a neighborhood that are put more closer together, what we say clustered together, giving more open spaces for shared facility, shared activity, where the cars are kept to the outside of the property. So there's no driving to a garage, everybody parks on the outside, walks through the neighborhood, says hi to everybody. It's a design of social cohesion that's built into that co-housing model. So that's an example of topology. So really what I'm looking at is both of those alternative housing in both the tenure and finance funding, as well as topology, and really trying to raise awareness about all the variations of housing that we can have that don't currently really exist in this country or that people are struggling to get off the ground because it's so unrecognized. And so just another layer of that is that we looked at land as just basically a commodity as well. And here's where the regenerative piece of it. So you were reading out about living systems approach and about eco-village design. And really that's another layer of thinking about housing is that we are in relationship with place. So wherever we live, we have relationship to the natural environment on which we are based and which is around us. So the water that flows through the property and the air that flows through the property, all of that is influenced by how we build and how we live in place. And really that regenerative piece is taking into consideration not just the social and the economic that I've mentioned in the built environment, but around that ecological aspect and the fact that we're actually in a living system and therefore there isn't the boundaries. You know, it isn't like this is my land and this is where it ends. A living system doesn't have that sort of boundary. And it's taking that into consideration from the soil and the microorganisms and the soil Uh, considering that. And how do we actually integrate our built environment with the natural environment in such a way that we're able to have resilience and sustainability and actually perhaps even regenerate areas that were a bit sort of, you know, dead because of the way we've developed previously and bring new life ecologically as well as social life back to an area. There's so much to unpack there. I mean, this is horrible to hear what's going on in your country with the 10 times the market. I'm in the States and I thought that it was bad here and the rental market, but to hear all of that. And I think it's very much something that I'm just thinking about this interview that I had earlier that will be going live the week before you. When we were talking about there is a very independent mindset, everyone's very individualistic. And when you're likening it to like the king of the castle and like this is mine, and there's just that possessiveness over the property because I'm less familiar with the ecological, which is one of the things that I definitely want you to dive into the ecological component to it. So I'm hearing all of this. How can we as people think that we own the land? Like that is just... (laughs) I mean, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir with this with you because it's just, it's such like, how can you think that it's not ours? 
how just arrogant of us to think that we as humans just own it all and we can just rape and pillage the land for our benefit. And yep, that's it. We've done what we wanted with it and it'll still be here next year and you know, next generation and three generations. And we're just not making that connection. Well, we're fortunate in this country as we have the Maori worldview, and that is an indigenous worldview of connection to land. And that land was owned collectively. And in this country, we've got two kind of governance systems. We do have the Maori land ownership. So certain rules and policies apply to how Maori can develop housing and develop in general and own land. And then we've got sort of more the colonial. And I'd like to see more of the Maori way And a lot of people who are in my field talk about that. We have the separation. Why is it that even as a Pakeha, which is a European descended settler to New Zealand, or a Toiwi, which is somebody who is from another culture who's come to New Zealand, why can we not benefit from the Maori worldview if we feel that that uh, worldview fits more of our own worldview? You know, just because we aren't of Maori descent, why should we be cut off? Because there's so much value. We recognize the value in that. And we'd love to see that being able to be accessible to other non-Maori people. And because I've lived in South Africa for many years and lived in a village area, and as well, South Africa is the same. There's more of like the settler colonial policies that govern the land. And then I lived in a tribal area and all the tribal authority, which governed those lands and how people could develop on that land. And it was very much more in harmony with the land. So in my area, people were made mud picked out of the mud that was local there. They were thatching their roofs with a thatch that was from you know, the felt area that area. So folks were able to collect their own housing materials and the chief, along with a bunch of elders, were able to allocate land to people based on how they were going to be in that community, how they were going to be adding value to the whole community, not just like, oh, I want this piece of land for myself, but anybody who comes in who would like to build a house or grow food is asked, how are you going to integrate yourself into this community, you know, and really be a part and share. And that allows for community and person to be in relationship versus that's not necessarily the case, you know, with our current colonial system. So part of the narrative that I work with and kind of the workshops that I can offer is around cooperative culture. So our individualistic culture has actually created a toxicity that we haven't really recognized necessarily. We see it, but we haven't really made that link to the toxic outcomes that we are dealing with now, climate change and the great divide economically and all these other problems and mental wellness, you know, mental health. All of that stems from, I believe, a lot of it is from this individualistic culture. And so we don't even really know what it is that we are doing that is so individualistic that is causing these problems. So it's a learning, almost an unlearning and a relearning of a cooperative culture so that we're able to live more connected and be able to resolve conflicts. We're so used to saying, oh, if I have a conflict with this person, I don't actually need to resolve it. I can just cut them off. And so if it's that neighbor on that side, I just don't need to wave to them anymore. Or if they're playing their music too loud, I can just call the police to get them to turn their music rather than actually engaging. So part of my work is actually helping people to work through releasing some of the toxic pieces of behavior or thinking that they have and practicing. And it's an ongoing practice of how to be in collaboration and in cooperation with each other when it comes to making decisions, resolving conflict, and how we actually can live closer together in that collective way. So you're talking a lot about community and you spoke about social cohesion and you know just the cooperative culture. Do you think that the individualist mindset is what's wrong with conventional models of human settlements? Or is it a combination of a bunch of things, especially when we're talking about the way we see land as a commodity? I mean, is it just a combination of things or what is really at the heart And I don't know if you can make this global, I mean, or if it's just community to community, but what do you think is really at the heart of it so that we can change this? 
I definitely think the individual mindset, and there's also a profit driven, as in most governments, there's lobbyists. In in this case, it's sometimes the homeowners themselves who want to keep policies the way they are because it allows them to keep the wealth that they have. So it's, yeah, a combination. And it probably, yeah, all does stem, I guess, from the individual mindset. And it's also that my consequences are limited rather than the consequences of my behaviors and the way that I think about home ownership actually do ripple out in many other ways. So, yeah, I do think that individual culture mindset is one of those things that I do highlight that. And that's if we go back to that term regenerative. We use the word nested systems, which I think is a really great way to think about ourselves rather than the individualistic. So nested would be, you know, who am I here in my place? My place is nested within a neighborhood. My neighborhood is nested within this larger community. This larger community is nested in a watershed or an ecological area. And this ecological area is nested in and you can keep rippling out and saying, well, each one of my decisions or the way that I'm living actually does affect all these other systems in which I am nested. And we can make changes at all of those levels of nestedness in order then to be able to create a more holistic system. So it's really understanding, you know, where we sit and how we influence these other systems. And people, I think, push it away because it does come with guilt or shame, you know, like, oh, wow, you know, I am. (laughs) People don't want to admit it's actually quite selfish. They want to think of themselves as generous beings. Hey, I own this house. I have a lot of money and I donate a lot to all these good causes. I'm certainly not a selfish person. But if you look at how they're voting and their voting has to do with policies that keep the current status quo for housing in place, then there is selfishness in there. Like there's a nimbyism, right? Like I've got my place, you want to do, we've just got a policy coming out in August of this year. It's the density intensification of our urban areas. And they've identified a few urban areas that are particularly struggling with housing. And that intensification is allowing where there used to be one property in one house, they're allowing now three three three-story buildings. Now there's obviously issues around urban design and who's how are they going to be designed, which is another intervention where I think I can add a lot of value as a permaculture design person who's connected to architects. So we can design something that actually will look good and feel good. So yeah, sometimes the government like these just like quick throw out things of, okay, so we've got to have more urban density because people need to be able to live closer to the city so we don't have as much commuting and people can take the transport and all the rest. And then you get people who've been living in that area for quite a while who have their house and they don't want a three-story building right next to them and they'll fight it and they don't want more traffic or more people on their road. They want to keep the character of their neighborhood. Like I said around that, if it doesn't have a good urban design to it, and it is just going to be some ugly looking three-story building because it's profit driven. And again, this is where we get back to. So what's driving our design features? And if we're driven by a living systems approach, What is the living systems approach that takes in place the ecological considerations, the social considerations, people are living systems, as well as, you know, our nature around us. So if we're doing that intensification with a living systems design approach, we're going to end up with something a lot more beautiful that people wouldn't mind to live next to, rather than if it's a profit-driven approach to this density I wouldn't want one of those profit-driven structures next to me either because I know what they've looked like. I've had that happen to me where it blocks off the sun and it's just ugly and, you know, it's car-centric and that. So we need to look at those together. Okay, if people do have concerns, if we approach it from a regenerative process, and that's the thing about the regenerative process is it really builds the will of the people so that the friction or the opposition that happens when you have a new idea come into a place, it's actually worked at the ground level, building relationships and having conversations like what do people really value in this place? So if we're having a a bit of a NIMBY issue where somebody, but I've got the character and the character of the street and I don't want this big building just being built. Well, we need to then drill down. What are these people? What do they value? 
And if we can get to this common place, and again, that's why my name of the social enterprise is called Common Ground, and that's many layers of common ground. So in this sense, it's how do we reach common ground with those where we want to develop and we actually work from a principle and a values base. And if we can build these relationships, then we're actually going to create something that everybody wants versus let's just throw this solution in and too bad for everybody else, but it's needed because we need more housing. And it is a longer approach. It does take a bit more time and it is a little bit more chaotic in the beginning because you are getting all these different people's viewpoints and sometimes they're very different. The regenerative approach looks at, all right, well, let's find the common ground here. And sometimes developers certainly don't want that messy approach. They want something fairly simple and government is sometimes willing to engage But you really need very skilled facilitators to do this work, people trained in not only regenerative design, but good facilitation techniques and the willingness to give it some time to work through all these things so that we don't end up with more fracturing in our society. If you're enjoying this conversation, would you be willing to share this with another person you think would also be interested? And if you enjoy this type of topic, I think you will also like the Leadership School podcast with Kyla Kofer. She speaks to what it takes to be an extraordinary leader, from integrity to setting boundaries to discussing fears and failures. She will inspire you to courageously be the leader of your life. Check her out today. Can you actually define permaculture, what eco-villages are and how they're similar and how they're different? Yeah. So an eco-village is a regenerative human settlement that is based on a set of regenerative principles. So there's 32. So there is the Global Eco-Village Network, and they're the ones that really do the training and capacity building for folks, groups, even governments to be able to enable this eco-village design. And it can really look from a more modern kind of a development, you know, if it's going to fit into where it is going to be built, or it could even be, I would say, retrofitted. So again, it's really taking those design principles that fit under the dimensions of the ecological, the economic, the social, the cultural, and the worldview. And how do we look at those principles and then design something that is principle-led And what comes out of it will be reflective of the culture of that particular area, the need and what comes out of those people and what they want and need from that area. So the Global Eco Village Network has regions and eco villages will look very different in all the different regions. And what I like about where I'm living, I'm part of the Genoa, which is the Global Eco Village Network. Oceania, Australasia, which includes all the Asian countries and then Australia and this country. And we just get together once a month and we share ideas about how everyone is trying to bring these concepts to where they are and to be able to bring a mindset in general around the regenerative principles, not just for developing a particular project, but development in general. And so examples of what it could look like, I would say to go onto the Global Eco Village Network website, they have an Eco Village Design Education course. So that's a month long or equivalent of a month long, depending on when and how it's offered. I did you know, an intensive on-site learning within an Eco Village myself. This was in South Africa to learn about Eco Village design and how to do it. And anyone can take that class and they have other courses So eco-village is more, I would say, topology in terms of like what it could look like. For instance, you can layer it. So you could have like a co-housing community that is also considering itself an eco-village because it is guided by those design principles. Or you could have even an apartment looking like structure that calls itself an eco-village because, again, it's guided by those design principles. So there's no one way. I would say to get a diversity of ideas of what it could look like and how they're done would be to go onto the Global Eco Village Network website. Wonderful. Thank you. And I know that Common Ground is a social enterprise. So how did you start this organization? What do you wish you knew prior to starting this endeavor? Mm. Yeah, I started it. And the reason why I call it a social enterprise is it kind of comes out of the problem that I'm trying to solve. And as I mentioned, there's so many different problems. <laughs> so 
there's way more work than I can possibly do. So in 2019, I moved to part-time within my employment. So then I had these extra hours that I thought, okay, this is the time to start my business. And so I just really started by developing a website and that kind of helped me. Well, what am I trying to say here? You know, Mm -hmm. who am I serving? And really broad because I have such a broad background. I have a master's degree in international and intercultural management, which is community development, but from a more international. So culture is very much a part of what I bring in, which is again, the common ground, which is, you know, that bridging of cultures, the cultural aspect. So there's that, there's the you know the economic piece that I'm looking at, how can I engage with the folks, the financial institutions or the policymakers around finance to tackle that area. We have a lack of housing for women in this country or a focus on housing for women. So I started the Women Revolutionizing Housing Network and that falls under common ground. I run a webinar series, bringing in experts and we had to ret- bring all of us women together I have a consortium. So the consortium is called Housing and Service. So these are practitioners who have anything to do with housing and or regenerative development, where we're coming together to be able to serve this sector of housing that is this alternative way of doing housing, who share that narrative that housing is a human right and that we need to do it regeneratively and you know, all these things and that we can do housing differently. And how do we serve this sector as a group? Because I can't do it alone and I need others. Like I don't have any architectural background. So there's an architect. I don't have an engineering background. So there's an engineer. I don't have a property development background. So there's a property developer and so on and so forth. So I've looked and kind of handpicked to begin with, but I've also on my website, I say, if you align with this mission, then you know, submit your expression of interest and we can add you to the consortium. And then if we're able to lobby government as a consortium, if we're able to apply for a project, um, like the government wants a housing thing developed, we could apply. If a developer wants to build more regeneratively, we're a team that they could work with. And, you know, if there's a community group that wants to do a community-led housing initiative, they could work with us because we're all connected and, you know, we get it. So the consortium is another intervention that I have come up with. And it's really common grounds just been looking at, you know, where are the problems? What does need to be solved? And how can I tackle this? And then the monetary side around the entrepreneur piece has been actually more tricky because the customer, the client, the one that needs it the most or the one that's more open to working with me is the folks that are wanting to do the community-led housing. These are people who want to live in this kind of community and are trying to drive it with very little knowledge, with very little resource. You know, they feel like they've got this mountain to climb. And so I'm sort of acting as a guide, a mentor coach to help them navigate all the different options that they have and help them to understand So there's that aspect. There's a training and education piece of what I do because all this terminology, it's very confusing. There's a lot to learn in this space. And as I mentioned, there's developers who might have more of a conscience rather than I just want to do this as a business to make profit. I actually want to do this to leave a legacy, like climate change really bothers me and I want to develop a housing community that is really climate resilient. Then they could come. So I've been really, I guess, just mostly trying to build up my credibility in the space, my leadership, my connections and relationships. And most of my entrepreneurial work has just been in building relationships and kind of defining this sector of what is regenerative housing and then looking for opportunities where I can to offer like either a product or a service. But I think it's the nature of who I am that I just have my fingers in a few too many pies. You know, I'm like, oh, that's a great one. And that's a great one. And I'm just in a report on housing for women. And I would like to turn it into an actual, both a brick and mortar so that there's a physical housing for women that we can put women into. And I want to look at a systemic housing for women for the country. Like, how do we have like a housing for women organization that looks specifically at housing through the needs and the values and the aspirations of women? So that's yet another project I'm taking on. I'm sort of looking at where's either the lowest hanging fruit? Where can I get funding? 
There's actually some very interesting programs in the UK and in the US that I've been talking with them and looking at adapting so that I'm not starting from scratch. So in the UK, there's an organization called Community and Homes, and there's a toolkit that has been developed called WayShaper. So I'm in communication with those entities to say, you've developed a good product that works in the UK. Could I, whether it be franchise or whatever the terminology would be, can I look at adapting it to Aotearoa specifics? And that way, I'm not starting all the way from scratch. I'm adapting. So I've just applied to our regional business development agency to look at, well, what would I need in terms of research and development to make that adaptation? There's another woman in the US with an organization called 500 Communities, where she's got a certified training program. And I'm talking with her about, hmm, could I maybe take your training program and adapt it to this country? So that's kind of where I'm at entrepreneurially as well as like the adaptation, I think, is just as important than me coming up with some grand new idea and saving myself perhaps a little bit of the time working with people who have a track record of success in their countries. That's fantastic. And it takes a village. We're all in this together. It's about the community. And if there's anybody in the audience that would look to partner with you or join your consortium or anything, all of your contact details will be below for them to be able to get in touch with you and help support your efforts because you're doing wonderful work in the world. So Zola, thank you so much for everything that you're doing and for being here today. Thanks so much, Tiffany, for getting the word out. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to the Humanitarian Entrepreneur Podcast. To stay up to date and receive free, valuable resources and action guides, you can find us at humanitarian-entrepreneur.com.